Welcome back, everyone. Um, so we are learning the exciting journey of the early church. We saw how amazing things were taking place in the church. But uh, at that point, the apostles were caught and put on trial. So let's observe uh, the various things that take place uh, during this trial. So we would need to read from verse 22 of uh, Acts chapter 5 uh, till verse 32. I request uh, one of us to go ahead and read this please. Acts chapter 5 verse 22. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in the prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. So uh, we have now seen that uh, the apostles follow the instructions of the angel uh, and they go to the temple and they start to uh, share about God and you know, preach about the matters of uh, salvation. But uh, now, because they have put themselves in front of the uh, people again, uh, they are caught and they are brought back you know, for a trial. Um, uh, before the authorities. So over here, one more thing to note is that uh, something unusual has taken place, isn't it? Because we are being told that though these prison authorities you know, went uh, to look for the men, they found the prison shut securely and the guards standing. So something very unusual. What did we see earlier? By night, the angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out. So the prison was shut securely, it says. Uh, how did this happen? It's, it's sounding like uh, a miraculous occurrence has taken place and the guards didn't even know about it. It's something supernatural which our minds cannot grasp. So they have come out. And the guards are still standing outside before the doors. Uh, but when they opened, they did not find anybody inside. Uh, I don't think this is uh, something that happened only at that time. And, uh, you know, like uh, it doesn't take place uh, anymore. Uh, I have heard one testimony of uh, Sadhu Sundar Singh, uh, who was thrown into a well. And uh, he the well was covered. That the well had already, uh, you know, some uh, uh, outcasts, you know, some people that that the authorities had condemned to death. Uh, they were thrown into the uh, well and they were already dead inside the well. So such a well, they had thrown him uh, and uh, shut the well and locked it up. Uh, but uh, there is a story somewhat similar, like angelic intervention, where there was a rope that came through. And he had no idea. He was just happy that there is a rope. And so he held the rope and he, uh, you know, uh, lifted himself up uh, through that uh, rope. And uh, the rope kind of, you know, 
was taken out of the well he got free uh, and when they found sadhu sundar singh outside uh, they were uh, wonder, wondering about who set him free but the, the story goes something like uh, uh, the well was still locked uh, and uh, to everyone's surprise the key was uh, the the person in charge you know the the highest authority who was questioning uh, he was the one who had the key on his belt so they were all amazed at how this man could come out of the prison when the key is in the most secure place with the uh, highest uh, authority uh, but you know god has his way of uh, setting his people free so something unusual has taken place to deliver the apostle uh, apostles and they have come out but uh, they followed the instruction of the angel and where were they they went to the temple and there they were caught uh, but look at the confidence of these men they are back at the temple and they are teaching the people the same thing that they were asked not to talk about remember the last time they were uh, 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 they were warned in acts chapter 4 they were told don't preach in this name okay don't use the name of jesus but here they are boldly proclaiming the name of jesus once again then what happens um, so they get these get a hold of these people they bring them back and they question them again and they ask them didn't we strictly command you not to teach in this name uh, why are they so worried about the name of jesus because uh, not you know uh, not very far uh, before jesus was under trial and uh, you know jesus the person the individual jesus because of him the community or the society was was uh, uh, at least the power that the authorities expected uh, from the communities the support of the communities it was divided because some were in support of jesus some were not in support of jesus now again bringing the name of this man uh, will affect their positions and their power so that is their biggest issue it's more of a political reason uh, why they are after the apostles now we don't know whether they were so worried about the miracles and the spiritual aspects of what was being taught maybe the religious leaders uh, we read about the high priest who had a problem so maybe they had an issue uh, regarding the religious matters but uh, it was more because of political reasons so now they brought them back again and they are questioning them they are telling them that you did not heed our warning why are you doing this again you are teaching in the same name the name of jesus so look at the boldness of peter who is peter fisherman okay so the fisherman is answering all these uh, uh, members of the council we have the high priest we have uh, you know the sect of the sadducees so they're all very uh, well established educated uh, people who are part of the council and the fisherman is boldly responding to them even earlier we saw uh, peter and john they were with jesus uh, which gave them that boldness and that courage uh, and even now though it seems like there is this uh, uh, you know like these levels where uh, the people who are questioning are uh, at a higher level of uh, education and everything that is not what mattered in that moment uh, we are not looking down upon education you know it's great education is great we should all be educated but uh, in this situation uh, peter is coming from another background so uh, he is you know an untrained person uh, and uh, un equipped person in terms of education and even then he is so bold before the authorities and uh, he responds to them <coughs> excuse me he says we ought to obey god rather than men so that is his response uh, i think rosalyn asked us a question uh, a little uh, before the previous uh, session uh, about the boss asking somebody to lie uh, so this is the response rosalyn the way peter responded uh, he he said that he will only do the right thing which is to continue to preach in the name of jesus so yes of course we can do it in a nice way but in this 
situation, there was some uh, amount of you know direct response which was required. Uh, please give me a moment. Please excuse me. Yes, thank you. So uh, Peter boldly responds because there was a need for him to stand up for what is correct. And he says, we ought to obey God rather than men. So when the authorities are asking us to do something against God, that's the time we have to stand up, isn't it? But we have other passages of scripture, you know, when Paul writes to the Romans, when Paul writes to Timothy, where he says, you must pray for the authorities. You must uphold the authorities uh, in prayer. Yes, all that is true. Uh, we must uh, uphold them in prayer. We must, you know, uphold the law of the land. But at times when we are asked to go against God, that's the time when we have to stand up for God. And we find that Peter is doing that. Another parallel incident would be at the time when Daniel and his friends were asked to bow down um, uh, to idols, and they never did that. In fact, uh, the friends of uh, Daniel, they, they went into the fire for doing the right thing. They stood up for what was right. And God always rescues his people when they are facing moments of persecution for doing what is right. So Peter is standing up for the right thing. And then, you know, he is boldly speaking about Jesus. In verse 30, he says, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him, God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. So it's very doctrinally rich, these few lines. We can even look at this as Peter is providing a defense for himself, but he's utilizing the opportunity to proclaim the gospel. Why is he stating these, these things? Because he is establishing the Lord Jesus as the Messiah. When he says, Prince, Savior to give repentance to Israel. That's what they were waiting for. Somebody to come, the Messiah to come and deliver, forgive their sins. So he is proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah. This is another lesson for us. Every opportunity that we have in this situation, in the prison or in trial, Peter is making use of that opportunity as well to talk about Jesus and uh, say that Jesus is the Jesus is the only way so repent he has come for the forgiveness of your sins and uh, he says that we are witnesses to these things and he also talks about the Holy Spirit whom God has given uh, and so he is presenting the faith that he himself is following now uh, something like this reminds me of uh, uh, a man called Richard Wormbrandt. Uh, you know, I don't know how many of you have read his life story. Um, he was in a communist culture back in those days in Romania when uh, times were very difficult and those who believed in God were in prison. So he lived in such a time and uh, he proclaimed once he got born again, his life was transformed before he uh, uh, came to know the Lord. He lived a very, uh, you know, morally corrupt sort of a life. 
and his lifestyle was not good. But once he was saved, his life changed. And uh, that entire book, In God's Underground, it, it speaks about how he continued to proclaim uh, the salvation message wherever he went. So he was imprisoned. And uh, for the most part, it talks about how he was in the prison. And even in the prison, with the prisoners and the guards, he would share the gospel to the best that he could. Going through all the sufferings that he was going through physically, emotionally, he would still proclaim Jesus as the savior. And uh, <clears throat> one incident where uh, 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 he wanted to share the gospel with uh, the person in the next prison. Uh, so the way he did it is, uh, thankfully, he had memorized scriptures. And so he used Morse code you know, by tapping to communicate the word of God to people in the other prisons. So amazing stories about people in their tough times still living for the gospel, for uh, proclaiming the, the truth of you know, Jesus bringing us salvation, to get this message out to everyone. Uh, and that's very similar what Peter is doing here. He's in a difficult time where his life is at stake. But what is important to him? The call of God on his life and the gospel. So to the authorities, he's talking about the Lord Jesus as the Messiah, the Prince and Savior. He's proclaiming uh, Jesus to the authorities. It's amazing, amazing to see the boldness and uh, the passion for the gospel. Now let's move on. So when all this is happening, uh, there is a defense that Peter is uh, providing. Um, what would be the conclusion uh, of uh, this trial session? So from verse 33, let's go ahead. We will read till verse 42. Uh, could somebody please help us? Gam Gamaliel's advice. When they had this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named, named Gala G Gamaliel. Gamelini, something like that. And the teacher of the law held in respect by all the people and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. He said to them, men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Theodias rose up claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him, he was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the censuses and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from those men. Keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. And they all agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy and they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus, Jesus as the Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Lubega, for uh, reading this section. From verse 33, uh, we have heard what Peter had to say regarding Jesus. And the response that he got from the council was anger. They were furious, it says. And to the point where they plotted to kill them. So now the situation has gone from bad to worse. 
um, and uh, the apostles are really in trouble. But in the midst of what's going on, God can still intervene. So look, the proverb says the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord and he can move it whichever way he wants. And so in the council, a Pharisee by the name of Gamaliel stood up. Now Gamaliel had a uh, high esteem uh, and a uh, uh, good reputation among the, all the people because he had a title known as Rabban. And Rabban is uh, even above the title, you know, we, we know uh, Rabbi, we use that for a teacher. But a Rabban is like uh, much higher than a rabbi, and they uh, it, it means our teacher. Uh, many wonderful things about Gamaliel. He was the grandson of uh, an esteemed person known as Hillel, who was the founder of Israel's strongest school of religion. So uh, this man is not an ordinary man. So God is working through a very powerful personality at this point. And uh, later on, you know, we will understand uh, from Apostle Paul that Apostle Paul was trained under Gamaliel. So which means that Apostle Paul had some of the best training, uh, you know, uh, as uh, in his past life as an unbeliever. So Gamaliel is introduced at this point, uh, a really influential Pharisee. And Gamaliel has a suggestion. What is that? So Gamaliel, he um, commanded to put the apostles outside so that the council can have a discussion. Now, who is part of the council? Many different groups of people. You have the high priests, you have uh, um, you know, the Pharisees, teachers, you uh, have the Sadducees, you have different people who all form the council. So now the council is having a discussion to come up with a solution for this matter. These people are speaking about Jesus and they don't seem to heed our uh, warning. Uh, this might turn into a bad political situation for us. What do we do with these men? So that's the question that they want to address. So as they begin to address, uh, Gamaliel takes them back to an example of a man called Theodos. Okay? So Theodos, uh, apparently he was a man uh, who, who had a following of uh, people. Uh, a number of men, about 400, joined him. And uh, he was something like a rebel. Okay? And uh, he misled people. Uh, and uh, after that, there is another example that he brings up, Judas of Galilee, who rose up in the days of census and drew away many people after him. He also perished. So basically, he says both these examples of Theodos and Judas, um, they were men who tried to get the support of the people, but both of them failed. You know, they perished. Uh, it didn't work out. Their uh, mutiny or their rebellion, it did not really work out. So the point that he's trying to make is that if these men are also going to cause a rebellion, uh, it won't work out. Don't worry. Okay. But look at this. It's coming from Gamaliel's heart. Now, it's amazing because a fisherman just spoke okay, with what minimal training. But Gamaliel, who is a highly educated man, he adds another point. He says, if these men are trying to uh, create a rebellion, it will cease like the others. But verse 39, we don't know why he said what he said. So what is the statement that Gamaliel made? He's saying, but if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. Wow, what was Gamaliel thinking? Was he beginning to be, you know, uh, get convicted about the Lord Jesus, uh, you know, being the Messiah? We don't know what was going on in his heart, but 
and advice came through the most unlikely person at that time, the greatest man of influence. What is he saying? If it's a human effort or a human activity, it will cease. But if what is going on is of God, don't put yourself against God. You cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. Wow, amazing. So uh, uh, we understand today that what started you know, 2,000 years ago, so many people have tried to stop it. And we can read incident after incident uh, in history. We can read about the dark ages. We can read about you know, times of persecution. And in fact, even today in the world, there are uh, pockets uh, in the globe where uh, so many things are going on against the faith, against uh, Jesus. Uh, people are struggling. People are suffering. People are being persecuted. But the gospel has not ceased to save people. The, the work of God has not stopped. It's been 2,000 years, roughly, since Gamaliel made the statement. He said, you can't stop God. He's, he's right. Nobody could stop God. And nobody can stop God. So what Gamaliel said then is so applicable even today. If there is something that God is doing, no man can stop it. And his work, Job says, who can thwart his work? He's the God Almighty. And uh, that was the advice of Gamaliel to the people. He said, hey, everyone, calm down. If what these people are doing is their own, it's going to cease. But if it is of God, then we cannot stop it. So don't go and you know put yourself against uh, 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 the mighty ocean wave and try to stop. You just cannot. You will drown uh, in the power of the wave. And so from verse 40, I, again, this is all supernatural. Verse 40 says, and they agreed with him. How did they even agree to such a statement? But they agreed. The council agreed. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, see, they haven't changed their uh, uh, original attitude. Uh, they had warned them. They had threatened them. Now they're trying some physical uh, uh, harm and uh, physical discipline. And they beat them up. Okay, hoping if the warning doesn't, if the threatening doesn't get to them, the beating will. So let's try. So they beat them up uh, and they commanded them again. Earlier, what did they say? Don't speak in this name. Again, the same point is uh, being emphasized. You should not speak in the name of Jesus. Okay, they give them this instruction and let them go. So they thought, okay, let's see what happens. You know, after this, uh, and so now the uh, apostles, they departed from the pres presence of the council um, and notice their attitude. Wow, excellent attitude. Verse 41, second part says, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. So sometimes for the name of Jesus that we carry, we bear, we may need to suffer shame. It's happened throughout history. Men and women who stood up for God have faced uh, you know, opposition uh, in various seasons of their lives. But what makes their testimony special? What does it say? Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. So the love that these people carried for God, that even death, or persecution or you know pain think about this this time it was not just warning physically they are hurting they are in pain they were beaten and when we talk about the uh, you know the beatings that are happening uh, um, uh, under you know the the governors and uh, uh, the authorities it would not have been just you know like an ordinary tap and then send them back it wasn't they would have really been beaten badly so they are in pain uh, and they've gone through a lot uh, because of the trial and being in the prison and so much has happened. But what, what is their response? They just thought, wow, 
we had an opportunity to suffer shame for the name of Jesus. We are so blessed, right? I don't know. I don't know how people can even think like this, but that's how these people thought uh, when they suffered uh, shame for the name of Jesus. So their lives had been impacted. Their lives have had been uh, so, uh, you know, powerfully touched by the gospel uh, that they were ready for anything, to face anything. Uh, and that's the kind of uh, people that we see uh, in the book of Acts. So uh, first of all, they are happy that they went through persecution and they're continuing their works. Nothing uh, is hindering them, verse 42. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus. It's like, yeah, and you know, life goes on. It's as simple as that. But it is made to sound very simple, but we understand that it was not simple. Uh, but it only goes to show what, what had happened to their lives uh, because of the salvation that they received from Christ and the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So let me pause for a minute and if there's anything you want to talk about, let's talk about that and then we'll get into chapter 6. We're not saying that, you know, we must invite persecution so that we feel uh, a sense of uh, being loyal to Christ. That's not the point. But when persecution happens, okay, uh, maybe we've done it all right and then we find ourselves in a position of being persecuted. That is an honorable uh, thing to go through. And... Uh, that's the attitude that we find among the apostles as well. So they did the right thing, but they got into trouble. And at that point, they said, okay, we got this opportunity to suffer uh, for the name of Jesus. We are rejoicing. Yeah, so just wanted to add that point. So don't go looking for persecution. <laughs> yes. Yeah, any, any other comments before we proceed? There are many uh, life, uh, lives of stories of the lives of people that we can um, actually read who lived in difficult times and who stood up for Christ, uh, who had that, you know, it's, it's like saying, I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. Uh, you all probably have heard that song. Uh, but they lived like that, that even if it means life or death, I'm living for Jesus. Okay, uh, so so much for us to learn from the people who have gone ahead of us. Uh, I I know that there are still places where people are facing such circumstances, uh, but also we understand that uh, things are so much more comfortable now. We have technology. Uh, some sometimes it's so easy to share the gospel, but then even those opportunities, somewhere we hesitate to take it up. But uh, to always remember that uh, people have paid uh, a great price uh, for us to have what we have today. And because there are some people who stood up for the truth uh, back in those years, we can, we now have, uh, you know, we have our Bibles, we have, uh, uh, you know, inspiring life stories because somebody has stood up, you know, tough time. Okay, so uh, let's not forget the way people were ready to suffer for the gospel. Okay, so shall we just move on to chapter 6 then? All right, great. So uh, let's uh, read about what is happening in the church. We talked about the rising persecution till now. And uh, now let's look a little bit inside the church. What's happening within the community? Even chapter 5 started with something that was happening within the community, right? The heightened uh, presence of God, the mighty work of the Spirit, and sin showed up. And so there was judgment 
right? And quicker judgment. So whenever we experience a revival, uh, it's a given that, you know, uh, sort of judgment uh, will be seen and a quick judgment like the one that we saw in the case of Ananias and Sapphira. So in Acts chapter 6, there is a, uh, a little bit of a crisis in the church, which the apostles have to solve. So let's read from verse 1 uh, all the way till verse 7. Acts 6, verses 1 to 7. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distributions. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve devils. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And, and the saint pleased the whole multitude and they choose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Porosius, Nicardo, Timon, Paramenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they said before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great Many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Zali. So now within the church, um, we earlier said it's a growing church. It's a thriving church, uh, spiritually in numbers and uh, in um, high esteem among the people. So at this time, when the number of disciples was multiplying, meaning the growth is continuing, uh, there arose a complaint. Okay. So, uh, as I said earlier, it's not like this church, uh, we can have a very uh, rosy picture of the early church, but at the end of the day, they were people. And so there were issues in the church, but the point is not so much that there are issues in the church, but the, the, the focus should be on how to resolve those issues, depending on the communities that we serve um, as pastors, as leaders, problems will happen. Now, recognize the problem and find a solution. So this section is the beautiful way in which the apostles solve the problem. Uh, so Luke is stating uh, the matter in the church, which is simply regarding food distribution. So there was a complaint against the Hebrews. Who are the Hebrews? They are the um, you know Hebrew-speaking Jews. By the Hellenists. Who are the Hellenists? They are the Greek-speaking Jews. Okay, so among two communities, there are two language speaking communities, uh, and they have an issue. So the Hellenists are saying that their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Remember, we saw earlier that those who had need, there was a supply. So the admin office is working very well. Church of Jerusalem administration is uh, nice, you know, they, they have their rosters, the food is being served. The, Money is coming in, the food is being bought, cooked nicely, given to the people. All that is going on beautifully. But someone is noticing that, oh, uh, the, uh, the people who speak this language, they are not giving the food to the people who speak the other language. Okay, So you're like, that's the last thing that should come to your mind. But it is a real issue which needs to be addressed. Maybe it was not intentional. Maybe it just happened. We don't know why it really happened. Then. The 12 uh, summoned the multitude of the disciples. So what does it mean? It means that they're addressing the issue. So when there is an issue, what is the task of the leadership? They're supposed to address the issue sufficiently uh, by the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. So they are doing that. And that is what we must learn from. So they are calling the disciples and uh, uh, in finding a solution to the problem, they're saying, this problem has to be solved. Uh, however, you know, uh, we cannot get into this role of serving food uh, because we 
have other tasks which have been given to us by God. Uh, and what is that task? He they put it this way. The word of God. We cannot leave the word of God and serve tables. So now, uh, for us, for people who are in leadership, we ask the question, oh, that means that I must never serve tables. Serve tables is a way of uh, describing the ministry of helps, where uh, we could be handling the logistics, you know, the, uh, the operational aspects of things that are going on. See, Luke is not saying that operations is... Uh, you know, not so godly as compared to teaching the word of God. It's not like that. Every responsibility that God gives us is to worship him and we honor it. Uh, but in the case uh, of the apostles, one of the primary responsibility which they had was to uphold the word of God. So it is their primary role. Now, if they give time to other activities, they may not have sufficient time for the uh, word of God, uh, which where they need to, you know, really meditate and um, study and teach the people the word of God, which was most important. So basically, this is an issue of prioritization. And they're saying we cannot give our time. We're not in a position where we can give our time which is meant for the word to other responsibilities. Uh, so other responsibilities need to be addressed. So how do we do this? We can't give our time because we have to focus on the word. So then they come up with a solution. Let's just find other people who can give their time uh, in the uh, operational aspects. Okay. So as uh, those who are called in the positions of uh, you know, a pastor, a teacher. Uh, this is also a reminder for us that when God calls us to prioritize the word of God, teaching of the word of God, we must not um, give it second place. Uh, I know it's really hard because there is so much work to do in the church. We're running around, we have to sort out this, sort out that, and study the word, and teach the word. But eventually, a wise thing to do will be to delegate. Uh, a wise thing to do will be to develop a structure where uh, uh, we can't do everything. So slowly, how about we find good uh, people of God according to the call of God on their lives uh, and then start to hand off certain responsibilities and guide them, instruct them how it needs to be done. That way, we can dedicate our time more into the doctrine and the word of God. Okay, so uh, let's not get this understanding that serving tables is less than uh, the word of God, not at all. In fact, sometimes, uh, even if we are called to the ministry of the word, we need to step into other tasks uh, and take care of other tasks because it, everything is worshiping God. Okay, let's move on. So now uh, they have come to the conclusion that they must have uh, this task delegated. Now, who do they delegate the task to? Uh, we are told that there were seven men. They seek out from among uh, them seven men uh, with a criteria. There's a list. They must have good reputation. They must be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom uh, whom they want to appoint over this business. Now, wait a minute. We want people to serve food. Why do you need people with good reputation? Why do you need them to be filled with the Holy Spirit to serve food? You know, so this is how we look at it. But when it comes to serving God, even in the early church, for a small role, they were careful to pick people with a good testimony. Okay? And testimony matters, right? So that's why when we equip our... Uh, the young people, we equip our uh, volunteers, leaders. We train them in all these things and we say, look, all these things matter. In the early church, uh, the apostles looked for men with a good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Meaning, uh, all this shows the kind of heart they carry for God. And once we are clear that they are devoted to God and they are, uh, you know, uh, devoted to the church, then you hand over any responsibility, whether a small responsibility or a big responsibility.
so they are identifying devoted men that was the point but devoted men dedicated men committed men uh, men who are given to the purposes of god such men even to serve the food uh, and they decided that they will give themselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word so in a church setting uh, as the church grows this is how it should be so the the pastors the teachers uh, they should be able to give more of their time for the word and prayer and delegate uh, other responsibilities in a in a uh, proper way in an excellent way to the right people so and what is one more thing beautiful thing verse 5 it says and the saying pleased the whole multitude so it also shows godly leadership where they are not imposing themselves you know the apostles didn't go and say uh, i will tell you what we have to do we'll uh, uh, have uh, these uh, seven men they will serve the food and uh, this is what will happen amen <laughs> so that's not how they did it they shared this with the people uh, and when the decision comes by the holy spirit notice how verse 5 says everyone was happy with it the others were pleased uh, the saying pleased the whole multitude so the others also were happy with it okay uh, now uh, please uh, don't misunderstand this as when we make godly decisions every uh, time there will be a positive response uh, from the people no maybe sometimes we are making a godly decision but uh um, that is not being accepted by the people those are moments when we have to uh, you know stand up for what god is saying we must uh, really learn to communicate uh, in in a in a positive way so that what god is doing uh, is acceptable by the people during that time uh, however uh, in general right when we are uh, sharing the wisdom of god with the people when it is at the right time the right uh, decision is being made we notice that generally there is an acceptance for what is being done so the people were happy with this decision and then they go and pick up men who have uh, this criteria uh, fulfilled so one person's name is mentioned stephen and a little more is spoken about stephen and what a man is stephen uh, we will see in scripture that there is not so much spoken about him we'll read about him in acts chapter 6 and then you'll read about him in acts chapter 7 and that's about it but uh the devotion that he has for god it it is life impacting uh, and you know luke is adding already they have seen the criteria for the people who need to be chosen but luke is adding to the nature of stephen and he says a man full of faith and the holy spirit so today if people were to describe us or if luke luke had to make a mention of us uh while talking about the church what what would uh, he have said about us about stephen he said a man full of faith and the holy spirit so you know these are all uh, really good things to think about uh, and uh, there were people uh, such people in the early church who were full of faith and the holy spirit and then you know there's a whole list of all the other names some of which i can't pronounce so i'm not going to read them right <laughs> and it also says a proselyte uh, from antioch nicholas who's a proselyte a proselyte is a person who is um, from another belief or another religion who has come to believe in in uh, you know uh, jesus so we call them as proselytes so you might see this word uh, here and there in the book of acts uh, so they picked all these people and they set them before the apostles and when they had prayed they laid hands on them laid hands on them you've seen that earlier and laid hands on them means that they were seized or they were caught but in the situation they were commissioned by the apostles to go and do the Uh, food distribution now when the problem was solved in the church what does verse 7 say the word of god spread and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith so whenever we handle issues address issues in the right way within the church god's work can continue unhindered what if they had not solved this problem 
what if the apostles had said, hey, come to me with a question, like a the theological question. Please don't come to me with food problems. But they did not treat a, a, a natural problem in a light way. They solved it. And praise God for verse 7. It says, then the word of God spread and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. So and those of us who are leaders, whatever capacity, uh, no issue is a small issue in the house of God. We need to deal with it in the right way. And that will also help in uh, extending the kingdom of God. So we're just going to stop here. Um, and uh, I'll maybe request uh, Jafina. Is it possible to pray, Jafina? Please pray. We'll wrap up for today. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. Thank you for this day. We thank you for the class that we have. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, Jesus. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for dwelling in us, Lord. The cross that you took for us, you went up to heaven so that we can have this Holy Spirit, so that we can walk in authority, so that we can use your name and, and live mightily down here on this earth, Jesus. God, I just pray for all my classmates and cousin Nancy over here. Thank you for the teachings that we have learned. God, I pray that you'll help us to apply it in our life, uh, where we walk in the Spirit and everything that we do, Jesus, where uh, we solve the issues in the right way so that the Word of God will keep growing among the places where we are serving for you, Jesus. We give you all the glory and honor. Build us up, equip us, Jesus, as we are learning the subject uh, to move under your acts, uh, to move under uh, your authority, your spirit, and your guidance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jafina, and thank you, everyone. God bless you. Have a, a wonderful weekend ahead. See you all in the next class. Bye for now.